Welcome back. The, uh, the last few videos talked, worked through the development of a, of a model for a bathtub and for a savings account. And I thought at this point it's probably appropriate to spend a little bit of time and talk about why is it that we actually create models to begin with? Um, why spend the time doing that? We, we typically have situations that we deal with that we want to develop an understanding of that situation so we can develop a strategy to deal with the situation, a strategy that actually minimizes the unintended consequences that actually make the situation worse. But when we try to do that, we, we have to realize that, that reality is actually com very complex and it often appears very complicated to us. And the cause and effect are often separated by either distance or time or both at the same time. So the situation is that reality is extremely complex and we develop models, we develop uh, depictions of, of the situation of interest to, to help us understand what it is that we're trying to deal with. And the, the comment that, that is rampant in the, in the systems arena is, all models are wrong, some models are useful from George Box. We, we need to remember that what we have de developed is in fact not reality, it's just some simplification of reality. It's a, it's a model intended to help us develop an understanding so we can better pursue what we're trying to pursue. And we develop, uh, the way that models were developed or understanding was developed over many, many years was doing something called analysis where you, you take something and you take it apart and you study all the parts and you attempt to understand that that thing by from understanding all of the parts and though there's a limit to what one can understand from simply understanding the parts one needs to understand the way that the parts interact and even if you understand the parts in the way that they interact there's still a limit to what one can understand. The, the comment about you can never understand why a minute is as long as it is just by studying a clock. There is nothing in the context of the clock that will give you an understanding of why it is that a minute is as long as it is. So analysis is unable to answer the why questions about things. This is a quote from Russell Acuff, um, a giant in the systems thinking arena. It, what's appropriate is to do both analysis and synthesis so that you do analysis to understand the parts of something and the way that those parts interact but you also have to understand the way that 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 thing fits into a interacts in a larger context and then you begin to understand why it is the way it is once you understand the larger context that it's part of so remember that it's appropriate to do analysis and synthesis to develop an understanding and you use that to create models but you can create there are tons and tons of different kinds of models I'll talk about three that are that are very often used the first one being what's referred to as a rich picture and this is an example it's simply a picture of of pictures of things, different components that interact in some way and, and the picture is meant to, to convey an understanding of what the components are and the way that they influence each other. Rich pictures have essentially no rules associated with how you develop them. You simply use different pictures and, and connectors and label it so that it's, it provides a level of understanding for what it is that you're trying to understand. A bit more detailed, a bit more specific than a rich picture is something called a causal loop diagram, wherein there are a set of well-defined guidelines about how you draw causal loop diagrams in that you have variables, you have influences between the variables and those influences have 
well-defined meaning in terms of a positive or reinforcing influence such that if the interest increases the principal increases or the interest adds to the principal whereas for a negative or a balancing feedback as the current state increases the action decreases or the current state adds to the action so it's a it's a much more rigorous definition of how you develop the diagrams typically uh, causal loop diagrams only have variables and influences as opposed to uh, rectangles which represent stocks and I'll talk about them a bit more in, in a minute but I find that by explicitly identifying those things in the causal loop diagram which represent a quantity of something that that can't change instantaneously that has to change over a period of time makes the the model less ambiguous over time so that's we've talked about rich pictures and and causal loop diagrams the the third one is called stock and flow models they're the kind of model that one uses to develop a simulation wherein there is a very rigorous set of guidelines as to what can connect to what and how and every single element of the model has a value or an equation associated with it and it's defined in such a way so that you can actually have the computer simulate the model and tell you how the the interactions the relationships defined in that model change over time so it's so it's a very explicit form of model it's it's much more difficult to develop and that uh, everything has to be explicitly defined you need numbers and equations to go along with each one of the components so so if I can develop rich pictures or causal loop diagrams or simulation models why is it that I do simulations when causal loop diagrams and rich pictures are far easier well it's been said that humans unaided cannot predict the behavior of complex situations with two or more feedback loops and this these models that I provided to this point only have one feedback loop there are situations where there are multiple feedback loops and attempting to to simply intuit the implication of all of those interactions it's it's pretty much beyond our capability this particular picture is from from a paper by John Sturman and it's meant to point out even for a couple of interacting changing values how it's not obvious sometimes what the what the implications of the interactions are so that this is for a store where the solid graph represents the number of people entering the store each minute and the dotted line represents the number of people leaving the store every minute and looking at that picture and then asking a number of questions about during which minute did the most people enter the store well that was pretty obvious because the the solid line is larger than than the dotted line all the way across here and here is the largest value of it the next question during which minute did the most people leave the store well that's this at this point it transitions so that there are more people leaving than entering and this is the largest value of that that graph then the question is during which minute were most people in the store well from this period to this period the number entering was always greater than the number leaving so this is the point at which there are the largest number of people in the store and then the final question during which minute were fewest people in the store from this point to the end that there are more people leaving every minute than there are entering so the number of people in the store continues to get less every minute so at 
at time 30 is the fewest number of people in the store. So this is just to give you a sense of what happens in terms of transitions. It can, can be far more difficult to understand what's going on in the model. This is a Rookies Pro model that is often used in Introduction to System Dynamics to point out the implications of influences not being quite so obvious. This is a, a model for a consulting company that has 120 employees. It has 60 rookies and 60 pros, and it wants to maintain the, the same number of employees on an ongoing basis so that uh, for every pro that quits, it hires a new rookie, and it takes six months for a rookie to be trained to become a pro. It bills out its rookies at 5K a month and its pros at 15K a month, so it has a well-defined revenue stream. This is one of those uh, mystical companies that has a 100% applied rate all the time. So when you... Oh, and, and 10 pros quit every month, so there are 10 rookies hired. And this, this model is actually in a steady state situation whereby the total number of rookies is 60 and the total number of pros is 60 and there are 10 pros that quit every month. And the revenue for the organization is 900K a month for the pros, 300K a month for the rookies, 1.2 million a month um, in total for the organization. So now if, if in month 10 the number of pros that quit every month jumps from 10 to 15 the question is what happens to the other values in this model there's only been one single change at one point in time the number of pros quitting changes from 10 to 15 so we run the model and it will give us a sense that while at time, at this particular time, the change was from 10 to 15, but what that did was it set off a transition in the organization where the total number of rookies went from 60 to 90, and the total number of pros went from 60 to 30, and the organization restabilized at those two level, at those levels. And at the same time, the revenue within the organization, the pro revenue declined, the rookie revenue increased, and the total overall revenue for the organization declined. Now, if somebody wasn't paying attention and all of a sudden, at this time, realized this situation, where is it that you think that they would look for the problem? Back here? No. They're going to look for it local to where the problem is. Akoff had a habit of saying, wherever it is that you found the problem, the real problem is most likely to be somewhere else. And in this case, one would have to go back six months to go find out why it was that the, the pro quits changed from 10 to 15 a month. So hopefully this sequence has given you a sense of that we create models to, to help us develop an understanding of the interactions associated with the situation to give us a better chance of developing an approach for actually dealing with the situation. And in future videos, we'll get into how to develop the different types of diagrams, developing um, rich pictures and causal loop diagrams, and using InsightMaker to actually develop simulation models. So. Thank you. See you in the next video.